All right, we have been um, going through the book of Revelation and we finished. We finally finished Revelation. But what I wanted to do this evening before we move on to anything else, as I, as I mentioned last week, what I'm going to do is um, do a, a revision of the entire book this evening. So um, we have been revising and backstepping and all of that as we went through. But I, I always believe it's helpful if we can have a an overall view of panorama. Some of us are fairly new to the group uh, and so it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to you. I, I always don't like to spring new things on people before they understand the background because then it leads to misunderstanding. But um, I'm going to try to see if we can go back over and give a broad overview if we can do that in one hour, hour and a half, then I'll be happy. So we'll see what happens. All right. And um, I also want it to be a session in which if, if there are blank spaces where you are not familiar with, with what is being said or you want a little more clarification, if I'm able to do this, I will do it. So please stop me if there's something that is not clear. I don't guarantee that I'll be able to um, to, to give an answer because I also have those spots, those areas where I'm not quite sure. But what I'll do is um, I'll do the best that I can. Yes, Brother Warren, go ahead. Uh, when you, when you uh, started the study, you started at um, chapter four. Are you going to do anything with the first three chapters or maybe give us a bit of an overview of what do you think of the first three chapters? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I didn't remember that we hadn't done it, but as you remind me, that's true. We started at chapter four because I wanted to get into um, the main message. Uh, what I will do, what I will do is, because I'm not, I was mentally prepared for it. What we can do is we can go back to those three chapters next week. But um, what I'll do this week is, is revise what we have been through, and then next week I'll go to the next three chapters, the first four chapters. All right, so I'm going to go to my Bible. We did start from chapter four, as Brother Warren pointed out, and um, the, the, the most important aspect of, of how we approached the book of Revelation is that we were looking at the book of Revelation as an unfolding of something that was presented in the book of Daniel. So just to quickly remind us, we're going to go back to Daniel chapter 7 and um, we really have to, we really have to go, to, we should have gone through Daniel before we got to Revelation. We kind of jumped into it because it just seemed like something we should look at right away. But we are definitely going to go back to Daniel to give us a better background of why we came to um, Revelation with this kind of mindset. But in, in, Reve in Daniel 7, this is the foundation of what we saw in Revelation. The overview of it is that in Daniel 7, there were four beasts that came up out of the sea. Lion, like a lion, like a bear like a leopard and a fourth beast that was dreadful and terrible exceedingly terrible strong <coughs> and i think all of us are very familiar with the understanding that almost everybody in the world who, who knows anything about his bible <coughs> believes that these four beasts represented the, the kingdoms of babylon media persia greece and rome and that according to the Bible, according to Daniel, the book of Daniel, these four kingdoms were to be the four great empires. We said empires. We chose the word empire rather than kingdom. And the reason is that there are two symbols used to represent kingdoms. There are horns and there are beasts. And if you say, why is it sometimes a kingdom is represented as a horn and why sometimes as a beast? We suggested that the reason is because a beast is a greater kind of kingdom, which is an empire. 
and an empire is a kingdom that contains other kingdoms within it so for example the babylonian empire was dominant over the the the, the israelite kingdom over the persian kingdom over the greece kingdom it dominated other kingdoms and subdued them and they were a part of the overall babylonian empire so so empires are designated as beasts and individual kingdoms as horns so anyway we saw that these four empires are the four great empires that would rule over the earth from the time of daniel until the end of the world four great empires and we said that what we saw happening was that there was a little horn that came up among them we never looked at this little horn in detail we will do that when we are going through the book of daniel and then while this little horn this little horn began to speak great things and to persecute the people of god but then it says that following this following the fourth beast after the fourth beast remember and the fourth beast is rome the empire of rome is the last beast that is brought to light in the book of daniel after during the time of the roman empire it says i saw till the thrones were cast down we said this word should read the thrones were set in place and the ancient of days did sit that is god takes his seat his garment is as white as snow the hair of his head like the pure wool so we saw that god took his seat and um a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him thousand thousands ministered unto him ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him but the point we are looking at is that the judgment was set and the books were opened so what we see here in daniel chapter 7 is that during this period when the the, the little horn is speaking great words and the fourth beast the roman beast is still reigning on earth it's still in exercising great influence on planet earth a judgment takes place and this is not a judgment where people are called up before god and they are demanded to answer for their sins it's a judgment that is based on books the books were opened this is the, when i look at the book of, of daniel and when i compare it with the book of revelation it's very clear to me and we, we, we made this point while we, while we were going through this. It's very clear that there is a judgment that takes place before Jesus comes again. I know that this is a teaching that is promoted by the Adventist Church and it is strongly opposed by Christians, by other Christians. I don't agree with the other Christians. I believe that the Bible teaches a pre-Advent judgment. The way the Adventist Church emphasizes it the emphasis put by the adventist church i don't agree with the, the emphasis because the way the adventist church em, um, presents this judgment they make it out to be a judgment in which the 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 destiny of god's people is being decided it's a judgment that makes people afraid because they say your name can be called at any time and if your name is called you could be lost i don't agree that that is what the judgment is about the judgment is not to is not to jeopardize my salvation it's not to decide whether i am saved i i was saved when i became a christian 46 years ago a judgment cannot change that but what the judgment is to do is to demonstrate it's not to it's not to it's not to decide it's to demonstrate it's a different thing if god examines your life as a christian if, if he puts your life on display, what is he doing? He's just showing the universe what the gospel is able to do in the lives of his people. It's a judgment. But, but if you look at what it ha happens next, and I'm just spending a little time on this because I want to just emphasize the foundation of the book of Revelation. We find it here in Daniel. So it says that this judgment takes place, and let's see what happens next. And then... I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which your horn speak. In other words, Daniel says, I, I kept on looking. I kept looking because of these great words that were being spoken. And what did he see? I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. 
I'm going to look uh, in the right column here. I'm going to write something. Okay, I, I deliberately have a, a column here where I can scribble some comments. So the thing I want you to look at is the sequence. First of all, the horn speaks great words. The next thing that happened, the judgment sits. Then what happens? The beast is destroyed. So the point I'm making is it's, it's clear that the judgment takes place before the beast is destroyed. So the judgment cannot be after the coming of Jesus. It has to be before the coming of Jesus because as we see in the book of Revelation very clearly, the beast is destroyed at the coming of Jesus. The beast and the false prophet are there when Jesus comes to make war against the one seated on the, hor on the horse. That's in Revelation 19. And the beast is, is taken and is thrown into the bottomless pit. We know what that means. And so is the false prophet. The beast is destroyed at the second coming of Jesus. So this means that the judgment sits before the second coming of Jesus. Then the beast is destroyed. Now, the, the judgment, this is one of the consequences of the judgment. The, 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 the judgment has two consequences. Number one, the beast is destroyed. So the judgment is an examination of the history of the beast. Some, any, any of us might think, well, the, the beast is clearly an agent of Satan. What, what need is there of a judgment? Just throw him in the, in, in the fire and be done. We all know how wicked the system is. But that is not how God operates. The book of Daniel teaches us that before God overthrows any kingdom, there is, first of all, a judgment. We see this clearly in the book of Daniel. In fact, I'm going to go to the verse just to remind us of it. In Daniel chapter 6, I believe it is. Yes, Daniel 6, the previous chapter. It talks about the time of Belshazzar. No, it's chapter 5, I'm sorry. It talks about the reign of Belshazzar. And it says, in the night when Belshazzar was there, feasting with his lords and blaspheming the name of God, a hand appeared writing on the wall. Nobody could interpret this language until Daniel came and Daniel explained what the writing said. And um, if you look at what Daniel said, let me go down to where he actually speaks. Yeah, in verses 25 downwards. This, th verse 25, this is the writing that was written. Mene, Mene, Tikel, Euphorson. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tikel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That was the meaning of what was written on the wall. God sent a message to Belshazzar by an invisible person whose hand was seen writing on the wall. And the message said, God has numbered your kingdom. The second part of it says, you are weighed in the balances and you are found wanting. We spent some time looking at these two phrases. And we saw that the, 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 the statement, God numbers your kingdom. It has, a, it has a significance that we don't often think about. When somebody says, I've got your number, we use that phrase. When somebody says, I've got your number, he doesn't mean that he has got your telephone number. It's a phrase that we use. And those of us who have some kind of idea of the numerolo numerological system in the Bible, we understand that numbers in the Bible refer to value system, a system of value. For example, the number seven is a system of evaluation that God uses. When you, see some, when you see the number seven, what do we think about? We think about perfection. We think about completeness. We think about something that is, a, a, is divine in nature. Numbers have this kind of... of, of, of even, even when we were children going to school, you got 80%, 80 out of 100, the, a numerical value that gave you a sense of success or failure. And... Um, it's commonly used in all kinds of societies to enumerate things on the basis of numbers. So when the Bible says to uh, Belshazzar, when God says, 
when, when the angel said, right, God has numbered your kingdom. What, what, what God is saying to Belshazzar is, I have evaluated your kingdom. And this is a statement that speaks of judgment. God is saying, I've judged your kingdom and I've finished it. The second statement is equally significant in speaking of judgment. You are weighed in the balances. We are, we are talking about a scale. We call it a scale. In those times, they use, they use balances to weigh things. And wh why did you put things on a scale? You want to evaluate it in a numerical system again. You step on the scale to find out how heavy are you. In Jamaica, where, where they have a lot of um, little shops on the roadside, the government is trying to eliminate things like this now, sadly. But I mean, you can go to a little corner shop, you can buy two pounds of flour, you can buy a pound of sugar, you can buy two pounds of cornmeal. And there's always a scale in the shop. And they will put that item on the scale to evaluate, to make a judgment about it in terms of how much it is worth based on, on, on the numbers that appear on the scale. So it, it is, it's a very familiar system of evaluation. So when it says God has numbered you, God has weighed you, he is referring to the fact that Belshazzar and the kingdom of Babylon have been judged. So, I just pointed to this one in the book of Daniel. There's another place in the book of Daniel. I won't go to it because we're doing a revision this evening. But what we see, what the point I'm making is that um, when we see a judgment taking place in Daniel 7, it's not something unusual because it is clear this is how God operates. He does not overthrow a kingdom. At least this is what he presents in the book of Daniel. He does not overthrow a kingdom before he first of all evaluates it. In fact, if you go to Daniel chapter 3, chapter 3 or chapter 4, I think it's chapter 4, I, it could be. But when he talks about Nebuchadnezzar being made mad, as a matter of fact, let me just go there, all right? I'm sorry, we have been through this before, but um, it's so important a point. I want to revisit it. Right, David, while, you're, while you're looking for that, um, remember when Jesus came down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said to Abraham that he heard the, the wickedness have reached up and he has come down to see if whether these things are so. That was judgment. Yes, another suggestion that he had come to evaluate before finally making a decision. So it's a common theme in the Bible. Here in... in, in, in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, when he became exalted and high in his own, in his own eyes, there is something that um, is really strange that is said because it says when after I told his vision about this great tree and how um, it was told to cut down the tree and leave the root in the ground, um, when Daniel came to give him the interpretation, it says um, he told Nebuchadnezzar what is going to happen to him. In verse 25, they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen, as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. In interesting point, important point, it says that God gives these kingdoms to whomsoever he will. So, no kingdom passes away arbitrarily god gives it to whomsoever he will but, but 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 look at what else it says here i'm looking at the wrong place it's the right chapter but i'm looking for the place all right let me go up a little bit more because there's a statement that is made um All right, let me just look and find it. It's somewhere in this chapter, but it's not catching my eyes um, at the moment. Let me just type in the word. It's verse 16. This is chapter 5, Brother David. No, this is 4, Brother I, I, I am Brother Began. Chapter 4. 
Yeah, it's verse 17. Right. I wanted to know this, what, what it says here. All right, I have to mute again because I'm getting it again. All right, see what it says? Uh, the decree goes forth that Nebuchadnezzar is to be, it says in verse 14, he cried aloud and said thus, hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it and the fowl from his branches. Now the next two verses is what I want us to focus on. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. The next verse. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones. This is the point I really want to focus on. Who makes this decision? It is not God alone. There are, there are beings in heaven that are being described here as the watchers. And I don't know if this is the angels. And the demand by the word of the holy ones. All right, some would say this, this is a certain category of um, angels, but whatever it is, God, God makes a decree. And it says that the, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth to it whomsoever he will. But the point is, even though it is God's decision, how does God make his decision? How does God decide to overthrow a kingdom? He does not do it alone. There, is, there are some, some heavenly beings that are referred to as watchers and holy ones. They are the ones who have made this decision. In other words, what we can see when we tie the scriptures together, we see that there is a, a sitting in heaven when God sits down in judgment and these heavenly beings come and based on what they see these kingdoms doing, they make recommendations. And as the angels make recommendations, God makes the decree. And why does God operate like this? Because God is not a dictator. Everything that God is doing is, is, is justified by the heavenly beings because God is ruling in a system. You would say it's a democratic system. I, I wouldn't quite give it that title, but it's a system where God is not operating on the basis of arbitrary, his, his own private information everything that he's doing is is before the the universe that everybody can know that in what god is doing he's fair and he's just this is very important to understand because it gives us the background reason for the book of revelation for the judgment whatever god is doing uh, th uh, this is so important because uh, many of us maybe like myself you grew up with a thinking that god is almighty he does anything he wants. This is, I, I tell you that this is the concept that the majority of people in the world have. And this is why they rail against God and they accuse God and they become atheists and they become skeptics and believer, uh, unbelievers and agnostics because they say, if I were God, I wouldn't allow this to happen. I wouldn't allow this to happen. God is not a dictator. There are things that God allows to happen because he has to operate in a just way and he has to give the rights of people to be free, the rights of people to choose Satan, the rights of Satan's government. So God operates in a, in, a, in a legal way in what he's doing. And that is why he doesn't make those arbitrary demands. Look, I'm tired of Babylon. Kick it away. I'm tired of Greece. Get rid of it. No. First of all, it has to be seen that the way he's operating, this is why Satan was able to get God to agree for him to, to afflict Job in such a terrible way because it was Satan's right because Job was in Satan's kingdom and God was protecting Job in the kingdom of Satan. And, 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 and Satan wants to know, how come this man is on my territory and you're dealing with him this way? And God says, my servant Job, he's a man who is serving me. And Satan says, you think so? He's only in this because of the benefit that you're giving him. Take away the benefit and see if he doesn't serve me. If you understand this background, you get a better idea of what is happening in the book of Job. In everything, God has to act in accordance with the principles of justice. So, 
just to make this point that kingdoms are not so are not overthrown arbitrarily like that there's always a reason brother david yes sister maria go ahead um what is the is the watchers and the holy ones are are the same group of people or they're two different uh group um to be honest it, it's not absolutely clear in my mind because many times in the bible you have what you call um poetic language where they they emphasize something by repeating the word but they repeat the word and change it a little bit so it could very well be what is happening here when he says a watcher and the holy ones it could be the same group of people but i'm not clear enough i i couldn't say absolutely it is so it might be two different groups of persons but it may be the same group so I, i'm not going to be insistent on it this is why i just say um it's 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 other beings in heaven apart from god okay i thought it was it could be it could, or it could be uh the angels and uh, the people that are in heaven it could be, except that I don't think there were any people in heaven at this time, apart from maybe Enoch and Elijah and Moses. Oh. But I don't think there were any other humans at that time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the rest of them didn't get there until after Jesus was resurrected. So, back to Daniel 7. Um, in Daniel 7, again, we see then that, so there is a judgment that takes place after beast number 4. And what you see after beast number four, there's a judgment. And the first decision of the judgment is that the beast is destroyed and given to the burning flame. It says so in verse 11. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now it says in verse 12, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, but yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And what this verse is saying is that the other beasts, uh, the, the lion, the bear, the leopard, they lost their kingdom. But what is the point? When their kingdom was taken away, their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. In other words, when Babylon was overthrown, it was not given to the burning flame. It continued to exist as a, as a, as a people for a while. When Medo-Persia was overthrown, it continued. When Greece was overthrown, the, these nations were defeated by the next nation, but they, they continued to exist as a nation. But what about na uh, beast number four? When it is finally overthrown, it does not continue. It is given to the burning flame because, because kingdom number four is the last great kingdom on this planet. When it is overthrown, it is put to the burning flame. It is completely destroyed. There is no other kingdom on earth. That is to follow behind kingdom number four. This kingdom number four marks the end of this world. And yet it's not quite the end because there is still a fifth kingdom to come. But this fifth kingdom is of such a nature that when it arrives, every other kingdom is wiped out completely. Not so with the others. Babylon was overtaken by Middle Persia, but Babylon continued. Middle Persia was overtaken by Greece, but Middle Persia continued. Greece was conquered by Rome, but Greece continued. Rome is destroyed by the fifth kingdom, and it doesn't continue. It's ended. Bang! It's over. So that's what the verse is saying. I know I'm spending all my time on, on this, but maybe it's not a bad idea, because I want, to, I, want to, I want to just cement this point home. I saw in the night visions, and then the next thing that happens during... This period, this same great judgment period, I saw in the night visions, and one like, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Not, he did not come to earth. He came to the Ancient of Days. This is something happening in heaven. And they brought him near before him. Here is a vision of Jesus in heaven, even before he came to earth. But in the vision, John, uh, Daniel sees him as the Son of Man. He sees him as a human being in heaven. And, and a, a cloud takes him into the Father's presence. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. This is kingdom number five. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So we have it here 600 years before Christ came. 2,600 years ago, 
we have the, the, the testimony that kingdom number five will never be overthrown. It will never pass to kingdom number six. Kingdom number five is the last one. And, and how can we be so sure? Because it is the, the, it is the judgment, it is the heavenly judgment that makes this decision. And before the heavenly judgment makes a decision, they examine everything thoroughly. Now, notice, Babylon was given a certain time. I forget how long these, these nations ruled, but they, some 160 odd years, 200 years and so on. Babylon ruled a certain time. The judgment took away, was taken away from Babylon. The kingdom taken from Babylon, it was given to Medo-Persia. They continued for a while. It was taken away, given to Greece. Greece continued for a while. Then Rome came and Rome sat on the kingdom for hundreds of years and even today Rome is disintegrated into pieces but it still remains in a different form so before each kingdom is final a sentence is finally made about each kingdom there is a judgment kingdom number five is judged before it is established let me repeat that point because I want us to understand. Babylon is judged at the end, before it is overthrown. The Persia are the same. Greece and Rome, they are judged at the end and they are overthrown. Kingdom number five, when it is actually established, from the beginning statement is made that this kingdom is to last forever. It will never be overthrown. Why do they make such a decision? Why don't they give this kingdom a little time and to judge it first before heaven makes this decision? I hope you can understand the point I'm making. The reason why the, the, the watchers and the holy ones, the reason why they can make this decision is because they have had time to examine kingdom number five even before it was set up. This is the most important point of what we are studying. Kingdom number five is examined before it is set up. How do you examine a kingdom before it is set up? How do you know what the kingdom will do? How do you know what kind of kingdom it's going to be? And this is the beauty of the thing because this kingdom number five, it is established in two phases. So let me write down point number two. The second, the second, um, the second consequence of the judgment is that Christ receives a kingdom. Why does Jesus receive his kingdom before he's judged? His kingdom is judged. That's not true. His kingdom is judged before it is set up. Because the kingdom of Christ is set up in two phases. Phase number one focuses on the most important thing of any kingdom, which is the spiritual nature of the kingdom. The kingdom of Jesus was set up 2,000 years ago at Pentecost in the hearts of the citizens. You see, beautiful is God's plan. 2,000 years ago, before Jesus received the physical kingdom, God set up a spiritual kingdom when he sent his the spirit of Jesus Christ to live in the hearts of his people. And for 2,000 years, this kingdom has been on display before the world. The watchers and the holy ones, they, they are able to see what does the, 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 what does the government of Jesus Christ produce? What kind of kingdom is the kingdom of Jesus Christ? 2,000 years. I think that's time enough. And so when the judgment sits, remember the pre, the judgment takes place before Jesus comes again. And this judgment examines the kingdom of Jesus, which has been carrying on for 2,000 years. And it examines the kingdom of the beast, the kingdom of the fourth beast, which has also been carrying on for 2,000 years. The kingdom of Rome started from even before Jesus came. It continued through the time of Jesus. It continued through the ages and it exists today. It has had several rebirths. And it exists today. And so the, the subject of the judgment is the judgment of these two kingdoms. This is what we see in the book of Daniel. And so 
when we came to the book of Revelation, that is why we started at Revelation chapter 4, because Revelation chapter 4 takes you to the same place that we were looking at in Daniel 4. It begins with the seats being put in place and God taking his seat. It says, John was taken into heaven in his vision. He says, immediately in verse 2 of Revelation 4, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. A throne is set in place and somebody is sitting on the throne, which is God. And um, it says, Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Maybe these are, are, are also some of the watchers and some of the holy ones. And standing around the throne, if you go to the next chapter, you see exactly what we saw in Daniel. It says, um, I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So the place is full of angels and it's full of elders and it's full of living creatures. It's a very busy scene in heaven, but it's not a normal day in heaven. It's not a normal day in heaven. It's a special occasion. The occasion is the opening of the books. In Daniel, in Revelation here, it is referred to as the book of the seven seals. In the book of Daniel, it says simply, the judgment was set and the books were opened. But in Revelation, it says it's a book of seven seals. It's the same event, same thing like in Daniel. What we see in Revelation is a detailed explanation of judgment that Daniel saw. So, we saw that revelation, in Revelation here, John is taken into heaven to see this judgment. It's a judgment that takes place. And first of all, it's an examination of the two kingdoms, right? The kingdom of Christ is examined from chapter 6 to chapter 11. You have the examination of the kingdom of Christ. And then in chapter 12 up to chapter 19, you have the judgment of the beast. So chapter 12 to chapter 19 of Revelation focuses on the, 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 the age of the beast and, and his work in the earth and how God is dealing with him. While chapter, chapter 6 to chapter 11 focuses on the, the, the kingdom of Jesus and the development of his people and what is going on. So we have been through all this in a lot of detail in the studies that we did previously. I, 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 there's always a temptation for me to go back now and go back into those details because once you start touching onto it, you want to cover all the um, uncovered, all, all the areas that might raise a question. But I'm going to resist that temptation because we already did the detailed study and we're not going to do that again this evening. You know, if there are any questions, I'd respond. But we have been through this. So, just to show you the elements of this judgment. Um, we know that there is God sitting on a throne, and um, it says, before the throne there are seven lamps of fire burning, which are the seven spirits of God, and there are also four, four living creatures. They are described in the King James Version as four beasts, but the, the actual Greek language shows us that a better translation is that there are four living creatures, because a beast represents an earthly kingdom. These are not kingdoms. These are these are uh, beings, heavenly beings, who are represented with certain strange features. The head of a calf, the head of an eagle, the head, head of a man, and um, the head of a lion. We went through all of that, and we we we, we saw what these things were were me were meaning. But um, we're not going back to go back through this. I'm just want to point out that um. In heaven, as you look at this, there's only one person sitting on the throne. There's one king in heaven. There's one who is, who is regarded as the Lord God Almighty. And this is the one sitting on the throne. Jesus is not seen as sitting on the throne. He's not seen as the Lord God Almighty. Here, like everywhere else in the Bible, Jesus is presented as the Son of God, as, as the, the Christ, as God's anointed one. 
But this Trinitarian confusion is absolutely missing in the book of Revelation. It's not just missing, it's definitely spoken against in the teaching of Revelation. And what we saw in chapter 5 was that um, in verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. This book is something extraordinary. What is this book? What is in this book? Um, let me just... The book of the seven seals, which is the same as the books were opened in Daniel. Same thing. It's just a different representation in Revelation. The importance of this book cannot be overestimated because, of course, you understand that the destiny of the kingdom of Christ depends upon what does this book reveal. Because remember, as I said, God does not arbitrarily say, you take the kingdom, you be kicked out. No, it's a decision made based on unbiased judgment. There are beings in heaven who are examining everything and making decisions and God is ratifying those decisions because God is not a dictator. He has the power, all the power in the universe. But God is fair. God is fair. Our guarantee of safety is that God will not operate in an unfair way. That's our guarantee. You want to say something, Brother Tony? David, question. Go right ahead, Brother yeah, Tony. Uh, so before Satan's government be destroyed, is 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 that what it's talking about at first? I think it's first Corinthians six three that 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 even we would judge angels. I believe yeah, is that first Corinthians six three? I believe that's that's implied in that verse, Brother Tony. I believe that's implied in that verse. You know, when it says we shall judge angels. Um, but I don't think this is the, the moment. I think it will be during the thousand years. Right, 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 right. But this is before we get but to heaven. So so. Like say that again. No, I was gonna say, but something like a parallel which you saying in, in Absolutely. Daniel. That's or be, before these other kingdoms are destroyed, the watchers and the holy ones, they too had right to the judgment before God presented the, his own um, judgment on them. Absolutely. One of, one of the great truths that is basically ignored or unknown by a, a multitude of people, including Christians, is the truth that God does not behave in an arbitrary way. It's right. very important Amen. to understand it because it brings, it brings clarity to many questions. The, 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 the first thing you learn about God as a child is that God is almighty. He can do anything and he can do everything. This, it's good to understand God in this way, right? Because he is. It's good to have almighty power on your side. But... The, the trouble is, I think my, my childhood was typical of, of most people because not just my childhood, my adulthood, I grew up thinking of God just as the Almighty. And I never, I never saw as clearly that God is also the one who operates in a legal, fair way. Because if I had known, it would have saved me from a lot of questions and a lot of confusion because I see the confusion among so many people because they think that God just does everything according to his own personal feelings. They think it is so and if it is so you would have to say why does God allow this? Why does God do that? Why doesn't God do this? So many things don't make sense until you understand that God's almightiness does not overrule God's sense of fairness and justice. Everything must be decided not by God and it's beautiful to think about it because when you have somebody who has all power and he does everything according to how he feels, what do you call that person? You call him a dictator. And, and very often that person becomes a tyrant because when you have absolute power in our world, in the sinful environment, it leads to absolute corruption. Absolute power leads to tyrants. 
since God has absolute power, it is imp- and, and God wants to be loved, God wants us to understand the loving person that he is, it is important that God does not operate on private information. God knows everything, but he cannot operate on the basis, I know everything. He must operate on the basis of what you know, of what the, the heavenly waters are able to see and to understand. God must operate on this basis so that he is protected against the charge that he is a tyrant. I hope we can understand what I'm saying because it is, it is very, very important to understand this principle in the conflict between good and evil. Because it brings great clarity and understanding to the reason why so many things happen that seem so unreasonable, seeing that God has so much power. But you can understand it when you see this. God operates strictly on the basis of these legal principles of right and wrong. So, we see that this book is there in his hand and nobody can open the book except the Lion of the tribe of Judah the root and the offspring of David, which is Jesus Christ. There is a lamb. In the midst of the elders, there stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And what this is saying is that Jesus is there, but in the vision, he's represented as a slain lamb. You do not see the Son of Man. In the book of Daniel, Daniel saw one like the Son of Man, but here you don't see the Son of Man. You see a lamb. You see an animal with um, seven horns and seven eyes. And um, th- this, this illustration is to teach us something. I just want to emphasize, even though we have been through this before, but I want to re-emphasize. Remember, the four living creatures, one has the head of a cow, one has the head of a man, one has the head of an eagle, one has the head of a lion. And they are full of eyes without and within. Now, clearly, this is not literal. If, if it is literal, you have to say that Jesus in heaven is looking like a sheep. A baby sheep, a lamb. And you'd have to say that Jesus in heaven has seven eyes and seven horns. But it's clear that it's a figurative representation because God wants to show us characteristics of Jesus and he uses the picture to give us the characteristics. So the lamb represents the meekness of Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. It represents the fact that Jesus shed his blood. This is why he is qualified to open the book. He gave his blood for humanity. So he's qualified to open the records of his church. He he, he shed his blood for his people. He's qualified to open the records of what took place in his kingdom. He also has seven eyes which represents the fact that he has all the knowledge of God. Eyes are the eyes that see. Eyes represent seeing. In in another chapter in the Bible, in Chronicles, I think it is, it says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole world. And, And it doesn't mean that God has two eyes with feet running about. It's a figurative expression that means that God sees everything. So when Jesus is seen here having seven eyes, what it is saying is that Jesus sees everything. Because it says these seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent forth into the earth. So the spirit of God, because Jesus, because the spirit of Christ is united with the spirit of God the Father, Jesus now is omnipresent. He sees everything just like the Father. He also has seven horns representing the fact that he has all power because he sa- as he said in Matthew, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So he has all power, he has all knowledge, and he is a slain lamb. So he's able to take the book. Nobody in heaven or earth can take the book, but Jesus, based on these qualifications, he is able to open the book. Notice that there are, there are highlighted points. If I go like this, look here, it's going to take me another five weeks to revise Revelation. I know I'm going too slow, but, but um, somehow I can't help really emphasizing these points again. I know sometimes with the point the first time, the second time, it's a little stronger. Um, notice, when he had given the book, when Jesus takes the book, the, four, the 24 elders fall down before the Lamb, having harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. 
and they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why is he worthy? Because you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. He, he died for men, therefore he's worthy to open the book. But um, the other point I want to emphasize here is what happens next. I beheld the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, the number of them 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And the last verse, the last point, every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, I heard them saying, I heard them saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. This is an amazing, amazing picture because it, it says every creature in heaven, in earth, in the sea, under the sea, everything in existence burst out praising God and Jesus Christ. What an amazing picture. But the, the, the point is, what makes them burst out in praising God like this? This is the point. As we are reading the book of Revelation, it's an amazing book, but everything... You have to make the connections. Why do they burst out praising God? And read this and say, okay, they are singing a hymn in heaven. No, no, no. Think of what is going on. The reason why they burst out praising God is because the book of seven seals is about to be opened. This is why they burst out praising God. This is what brings out this, this, this song of glory and praise and victory. It's, it's a foretaste of what will be the consequence of the opening of the book. This is why, brothers and sisters, I, I, I cannot downplay the importance of judgment. Let me be a little bit frank with you. Okay, let me be frank with everybody. Many of my friends, my brethren, like myself, have been disfellowshipped from the Adventist church. We have become offshoots. We have become rebels. We have become dissidents. <laughs> Other names that they would call us. But many of these of these brothers and sisters have become enemies of Adventist teaching. I can name some names. Okay, they have become enemies of Adventist teaching. There are Adventist teachings that I have re I have I have rejected because. I believe you, you need to defend truth. And where you see truth, you must stand by it. But you must not become foolish in just destroying something because it's associated with somebody else. Okay? If there is good in Adventism, take it. If there is good in, 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 in Catholicism, take it. Anybody might, somebody might say there can be no good there. Okay, fair enough. But wherever you see good, take it. If Satan tells you to pray, you should pray. As long as you're not praying to Satan, as long as you're praying to the true God, right? What is good, take it. So, the fact that I, I no longer embrace some things in Adventism, should I be stupid or throw away everything? One of the things that I've been blessed with is that I, 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 by God's grace, I try to examine everything. And I've looked at the arguments of non-Adventists and of ex-Adventists against the judgment. A lot of what they say, I agree with. I, the, the, the investigative judgment as it is presented in Adventism, it, it presents the idea that our, our salvation is jeopardized by this judgment. It makes people afraid of God. It makes people afraid of the judgment. And because of this, they just reject the doctrine outright. This is not fair because you just saw when we look at the book of Daniel, the judgment before Jesus comes is clearly in the book of Daniel. And as a matter of fact, the whole book of Revelation is about this judgment. If you throw this away, are you not depriving yourself as a Christian? Are you not standing against the revelation of God's word? How can you throw something away and label it as an Adventist teaching when the thing is in the Bible? It has nothing to do with Adventists or non-Adventists. It's with, it's, I believe it's in the Bible, brothers and sisters. 
it's it's it, it, it's there because God put it there and God wants us to know and look at what happens when these books are about to open God gives us a, 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 a preview of the consequence of the opening of the book and what we see that every creature in the universe is praising our God and his son because of what is about to be revealed in this book how can God's people be ignorant of this how can God's people put this aside how can you not suffer spiritual deprivation if you reject this it's important to me that every one of us who is hearing my voice should understand what I'm trying to say and should see for yourself whether or not it is true I don't want anybody to just accept because this is my opinion and you are you are you are you are accepting brother David's opinion I want you to look at the evidence one of the things we do when we look at the Bible we ask ourselves am I bending this to my own idea are there alternative and better interpretations you have to ask this but you want to make sure that you are not allowing your personal bias to take over one of the things that i find Good interesting is, and i'm coming just a moment um, brother Arthur. one of the things i find interesting is that a lot of people who find fault and they condemn it when you ask them so what do you think this means then they don't have an opinion or if they come up with an idea it is so crazy it is far worse than what Adventism was teaching so you can't this you can't develop a hatred a, a blind hatred for for system to the point where you you throw away even the good that is there the point I want to make we ought to be for God not against something but for God and then that will help to understand what we are to hold on to and and we can discard what is what is false go ahead brother Arthur yeah one of the things that I always say and I'll, I'll say it again no church no particular people has a copy or a patent to any truth from the Word of God no church no people if we can remember that we'll walk with truth honor irrespective of where it comes from absolutely thank you brother Arthur that, that is the, the 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 position that God's people should have because we we are we are jealous for our father's honor not our own we are jealous for our father's truth not our reputation we have nothing to offer and we have no we have no horses in this race we are simply ambassadors of our father and of his truth that's all and anywhere we find this truth and whatever the truth wherever the truth takes us that is where we go because we are his children and his kingdom is our kingdom and we are we are for its exaltation regardless of where that takes me takes us so this is the this is the background now to the book of revelation so the book of the seven seals is the judgment of the kingdom of christ remember according to daniel there's a judgment of two kingdoms number one is the judgment of the beast kingdom and the, the verdict will be that the beast is destroyed and given to the burning flame secondly it's the judgment of the kingdom of christ and and the, the verdict is that christ receives a kingdom that is to last forever and ever and ever it will never cease they know it's a good kingdom because they have seen the two thousand years of history tells them what kind of kingdom what kind of people this kingdom persists so even before it is established the judgment is passed. this system works this government is the best government let it last forever this one will never fail they know that for it is actually set up and the important point or one important point is they know this because the watchers and the holy ones find the proof in your life and in my life that is where we are involved in the judgment that is where we are involved our lives are the testimony to the goodness of Christ it's not that we are being examined to threaten our salvation no we are being examined to glorify our King that is the point of the judgment so it gives it a completely different perspective and it makes the judgment something wonderful something that God's people embrace not something that they are tentative and scared about praise God so 
to move yeah, along. Uh, hallelujah, indeed. To move along a little bit more quickly now. So we see that the, the, the book of the seven seals was opened by Jesus. And as the book, book was opened, he began to open seal by seal. What we saw was that each seal represented an era in the history of the Christian church. It's the history of the Christian church from the time of Jesus to the time of the, the, the coming of Jesus. And it's, it's presented to us in the form of seven seals. So the first seal we saw represented the first stage of the Christian church, probably the, the apostolic church. And we saw how, according to these seals, the nature of the church deteriorated. It turned from a, 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 a white conquering horse to a, 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 a red horse, then a black horse, then a pale, deathly horse whose rider's name was Death and Hell was following behind him. And we saw that the, 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 the public Christian church deteriorated and became something awful. But we saw that we went through the stages of the church and we saw that in the next stage after the, the, the church reached this terrible stage, there was a, the judgment began because we saw the souls under the altar and they were told to rest for a little bit. We saw that they were given white robes which signifies judgment. You don't, how do you give dead people white robes? If they are dead already, their destiny is sealed. How do they be given white robes when they are dead? And what we saw was that this signifies that they, their lives are examined. It is demonstrated that these people who died as criminals, as martyrs for Jesus, it is demonstrated that they were the best people. They are given white robes. Not that somebody hands them a white robe, but that their characters are justified. It is justified that they were the children of Christ. They are given white robes. That's what it means. The next thing that we saw was the sealing of the 144,000, which we understood to represent the last living Christians on the earth. We see that these are the people who will be used to represent the kingdom of Christ in the greatest way. Though the kingdom has been continuing for 2,000 years, it has had a checkered history. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Sometimes some really disgraceful behavior by people who call themselves Christians. But the greatest display of the true power of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ will be seen in the 144,000. And they are the ones who go through the great tribulation. And it says that they wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. So, we saw that after the 144,000 is sealed, the next thing that happens is that the seven trumpets be blow. And we, we saw that the seven trumpets are parallel to the seven last plagues. They are basically the same event. Each one of the, the trumpets affects the same part of the world, like the, the, the seven plagues. The first trumpet affects the, 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 the sea. Uh, let me see if I get it right. But it affects the earth. The first plague, likewise. The second one affects the sea. The second plague, likewise. The third one affects the rivers. The third, the third plague, likewise. The, the fourth one affects the kingdom of the beast. The fourth plague, likewise. The fifth one affects um, the sun and the heavenly bodies. The fifth plague, likewise. The sixth one affects the river Euphrates. The sixth plague, likewise. And the seventh one is the end, the, the great voices in heaven, the seventh plague, similar. So um, we saw that the trumpets represent the same period of the seven plagues, but from the perspective of the kingdom of God, from the perspective of, the, of what is happening. On, 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 on the, on, on, it's still within that, 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 that judgment of the kingdom of Christ, that you have the trumpets. When the plagues are revealed in Revelation 16, it's the judgment on the king on, on the kingdom of the beast from that perspective. If that's a little, I hope that's not um, confusing. But I'm assuming that mo that when we went through this, you all understood. So I'm just kind of revising. So after that, what we see is that there is a representation in Revelation 10 and 11. It shows us that before. The trumpets, before the trumpets begin, there was to be a special movement. First of all, 
the angel came down and he had a little book in his hand and we said that that book was the book of Daniel and John was told to eat the book and it made his mouth sweet but it made his belly bitter and we suggested that this 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 represented that God's people would 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 read the book of Daniel they would they would find the truth in the book of Daniel and out of this they would have a message to be given to the world which we say is the last message of prophecy which is what we're exploring today it's a message of Christ of our righteousness in the context of the last day events which is revealed in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation which is the things we have been exploring so this message is preached right up until the end of grace the close of probation when the witnesses are killed I won't go into the details but anyway just at that point now then you have the seventh angel blowing his trumpet and it is the end of the world that's the end of this period where it talks about the judgment of the kingdom of Christ then the book of Revelation moves now to the judgment of the beast the beast kingdom and it starts by showing you that there's a conflict between the woman and the great serpent called the devil that's Revelation 12 what 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 we start with we go back to the book of Genesis where God said to Eve uh, uh, God says to the serpent I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed so we find this in the book of Revelation in chapter 12 where the woman is in heaven and she's about to bring forth a, a, a child and we say that this woman represents the church or the people of God and they're about to bring forth a child and this child is Jesus Christ but the serpent is standing there to destroy the seed of the woman as soon as it is born but she brings forth a man child and this child is caught up to God and to his throne what does it, the, the, the devil end up doing he goes to persecute the, the remaining he, he goes to persecute the woman first of all then afterwards now he goes to try to destroy the last remaining portion of the seed of the woman the remnant of the woman's seed according to Revelation 12 and verse 17 and we made the point very important point that the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ the woman has only one seed so why does it say the dragon goes to destroy the remnant of the woman's seed if she only has one seed it emphasizes the point we have been trying to make the seed of the woman is Jesus the remnant of the seed is the remaining portion of Jesus's body you and I as individuals are not the seed of the woman you and I are, as individuals we don't stand alone we are saved as a part of the seed we are a part of Jesus Christ so when Satan goes to make war against the the seed the, rem, the remnant of the seed he's making war against Christ but it's Christ in the nature of his people in the form of his people because his people are a part of him that has been the message that we have been trumpeting God people are a part of Jesus Christ we are members of his body his spirit is in us his life is in us we are him and he is us Satan goes to he tried to destroy Jesus Christ he couldn't catch him but there's a piece of Jesus left and he goes to destroy that remaining portion of Jesus Christ and then we see how he does it right this is in the end of time what we see is that he establishes a system that he sure will destroy them he makes it that nobody can exist on planet earth he so completely envelops the earth by his system that nobody can buy or sell nobody can live unless they receive his mark what i've been trying to say is i know that there are some frightening things happening now frightening things what is happening it bears so many of the hallmarks of the mark of the beast that we are very tempted to say it is a mark of the beast I must admit that even when I see some things happening brother Howard just put on um, two videos in the in the chat in, on whatsapp in um, St. Kitts and in Grenada the Prime Minister of St. Kitts is saying that there's no way that anybody is going to be able to stop it they are making it they are planning to make it a law that everybody by rule of law has to take the vaccination 
and he's going to make he's going to, to to make it constitutionally a requirement he's going they are doing some examination of the constitution to make sure that they have the, the thing where everybody has to take it everybody who is a citizen there the grenada is the same thing they are, they are going to make sure that all employees everybody who is coming into the island and who is traveling and everybody who works in the in the tourist industry has to take it or lose your job i know these small countries they don't have a very strong constitutional base i know that in jamaica there was a, a letter that appeared where they were telling everybody at a certain company that they must be vaccinated or, or resign their job and it became public and it was published in the media and there was such an uproar they had to publicly withdraw what they they they, they said and even the government came out and spoke against it so in 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 the more in the more uh, highly developed constitutional systems it's not going to be so easy but I'm, I'm just saying this to show you the kind of push that people seem to be be, be making in this direction but if the, the the minister of of uh health in jamaica has said that he's going to do everything to the, to wipe to wipe out the, the the influence of the anti-vaxxers he's going to be making war against their their their, their promotions but i'm saying that with all of this happening it's very tempting to say that this is the mark of the beast. But um, somebody was trying to say something. Let me just finish the point and then I'll let you, let, you, um, let you speak. But what I'm saying is that whatever happens, don't ever forget that the, the, the critical element in the mark of the beast is the, the loyalty to God's principles. It's loyal. It's it's a system where Satan is determined that he will get you to rebel against God. Satan's rebellion against God is of a, must be of such a nature that those who succumb to Satan will be the mockery of the universe. It has to be something where you can clearly see that you are standing against God, yet you go ahead for your own safety. Therefore, it must be a clear cut system where you are rebelling against god i feel very strongly about this if if it's not clear-cut rebellion against god it's not quite the test it has to be clear-cut now i believe it's going to be deceptive but it still has to be clear-cut that anybody who has who has the ability to think can see and that is why even although this vaccine thing is so horrific and so fearsome i still don't see that element in it that makes me believe it has to do with the mark of the beast but i believe it is it is helping to establish the system the system that will bring about the mark somebody was trying to say something or maybe it was just somebody's microphone was open all right probably that was it so anyway not to go not to go, not to go back over this because we have been through all of this in great detail so the mark of the beast is satan's is satan's masterpiece to destroy the remnant that's his masterpiece and so we see that while it is satan's masterpiece it is also god's master plan to use satan's effort to work against him because what we see when the mark of the beast comes god says i will use this as an opportunity to reveal to the world and the universe who are my people i will use this as an opportunity to purify my people and make them so beautiful that everybody can see what the gospel of jesus christ is able to do yes brother david yes amen amen, amen. And, 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 david. yes go ahead brother Wayne. Um, I've never heard you use this term before, term, but, I've, but I remember growing up as Adventist, I've, I've heard about what's called a little time of trouble. Could what we, we could, if that, if that is true, could, be, could it be that what we are now experiencing with respect to the COVID thing and all of that, we are, we are in the phase of the little time of trouble? And um. Yeah, the, 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 the phrase a little time of trouble is from the writings of Ellen White. And um, you know how reluctant I am to um, mix 
mix it with when we are doing a Bible study. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's an unreasonable uh, phrase because I think that you have um, you have different levels of trouble, and I believe that the great trouble will be when the the laws are actually passed to implement the, the mark of the beast and persecution starts against God's people. You can call this a great time of trouble. I mean, based on the writings of Ellen White, Adventists have have um, defined three different times of trouble they have defined the little time of trouble they have defined the great time of trouble and then you have the time of jacob's trouble and it seems to me that you can make a case for each of these experiences but um the way they are conveniently laid out i'm not sure that um i could go with everything that is said here but basically the little time of trouble is supposed to be before the mark of the beast comes when the, the system is being set up and people are beginning to feel uneasy and people are beginning to find you distasteful because of the way you worship God. So I suppose you could say that we are in a little time of trouble now. And we know that when the mark is set up, then you'll have a, a big time of trouble. You can't buy, you can't sell, your life will be threatened. And then the, the third phase that um, she spoke about was a time called the time of Jacob's trouble when because of a death decree, God's people would be in great fear of their lives and um, they'll be going through a spiritual, a time of spiritual conflict and agony. I'm not so sure about this, but I'm not going to say it won't be so. But um, there's only one verse in the Bible that kind of suggests that it might be. And it's, 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 it's an Old Testament verse that had a primary application to the time of the Old Testament. And it was reapplied to the end of time. It's a little challenging to me, but I, I can say, I, I know that God's people are going to pass through trouble right until the coming of Jesus. But among the things that is said will happen during this time of Jacob's trouble is that God's people are going to be uncertain about their salvation. They are going to feel questions about their salvation. That is where I find it a little difficult to, 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 to accept because I know we are going to be in fear of our lives. I, I, I'm not coming out and saying straight and saying it's impossible because I know that when God closes the evidences against you, I know how that can affect people. When you find that death is at your door and you are praying to God and you don't see any outward sign of his intervention, I know how it can, it can cause your faith to struggle. And I suppose Jesus himself is an example of this because Jesus, if anybody had faith in God, it was Jesus. If anybody who knew the ways of God, it was Jesus. And yet, when he was on the cross and God did something unexpected, he cried out. His faith was, 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 was given a heavy blow even though his faith held on. But his faith was given a heavy blow when God forsook him because it, it's something that he never understood the Son of God who knew so much, he never quite saw this part of it. That's why he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this was the element that really tested him. And um, it's, it's reasonable to believe that if God is going to put his people through the test again, he has to bring something that they don't expect. Because if you expect it, you cannot be tested. So if we are going to be tested, it has to be that things are... There, there's something ahead of us that will take us by surprise and will will put our faith to the test. So maybe it's not out of place to say there's going to be a time of Jacob's trouble. You were going to say something, Brother Tony? Yeah, let me ask you a question. Um, it's told that Jesus, I mean, Satan will impersonate Jesus Christ. And Jesus also said, if you see him over there, do not go. And, you know, these are in the writings of Ellen White, um, you know, that Satan will impersonate Christ. Do you think this will be um, to enhance the mark of beasts? Or? I, I, I'm going to answer by saying I don't think it is impossible. But I... I I don't find it in the Bible, therefore I'm careful about teaching it. It's um, in, The closest you come in the Bible is the verse you quoted where Jesus says, if you hear that he's here, if you hear that he's there, don't go. 
But um, in, in, in the book of um, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, the devil himself is transformed into an angel of light. This is the verse that is often used to defend that um, teaching. But if you look at what yeah. Paul is saying, if you look at what Paul is saying, he's not giving a prophecy. He's saying that right, right now, Satan, the, the works of Satan appear to be pleasing, like an angel of light. And so even his apostles, his, his, his representatives, these false teachers, they are appearing as apostles of righteousness. In other words, he's saying that Satan's method of operation is deception. And therefore, it's not strange if his apostles also use this means of deception. So he says the devil is transformed into an angel of light. And he means that Satan presents himself in a way that is appealing to people. But... um. Will he appear literally as an angel in the form of Jesus Christ? The best I can say of that based on the Bible is that it's not impossible. But, but I, I can't find any verse in the Bible that says it will be so. The, the, right. the kind of deception that there will be in the future is probably going to be extraordinary. So it's possible. I mean, if it happens, I know that this will be something that would shake people to their very foundation because we live in a world where people are amazed by miracles and they are amazed right. by display and if he appears as an angel or, or if he appears in the form of Jesus Christ working miracles then who knows what kind of influence it will have on the world but um, when Jesus spoke about um, false Christ and false prophets and it, it seems to me that um, we already see the fulfillment of some of this. There, there, there are people on the world today who claim to be Jesus Christ. Some of them even bear the name of Jesus Christ. It's just that in our part of the world, we might not see it as much. But, um, for example, there's a man called Sun Myung Moon in Korea who was widely worshipped as the Christ. I mean, he had millions of followers. It's not a matter that he had or one or two little fanatical people following him. He had millions of followers. There's an, I, I think uh, some of them even came to Jamaica and they went up by Brother Howard's home and they offered to drink to have communion with him. He had, apostle, they, he has, he had apostles traveling around the world claiming him to be Christ. There's, there was another man in Florida, uh, 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 a Latino man, who claimed right. to be yeah, Jesus yeah. Christ. And, the, the amazing thing when you see these things is the multitudes of people that believe what these people are saying. They had great power to deceive. So I, I could see the words of Christ being fulfilled in, in some of these things. So I don't see necessarily meaning that Satan himself is going to appear as an angel. But like I said, I would be out of place to say it won't happen. Because I don't know. Who am I to say it, right? If the Bible doesn't say it, that doesn't mean it won't happen. But um, if, it's, if it's a major event in prophecy, I think prophecy would say it. If it was a major happening in the prophecy of, uh, of, what, of the end time prophecy, I think the Bible would, would speak about it somewhere, which I'm saying I don't see it. So I'm kind of like on the fence where it is concerned because I, I still like to know that everything I believe is based strictly on what the Bible says. That's the position that I, I, I want to hold. So anyway, let me just quickly wrap up. So, so after the mark of the beast crisis, which will judge the world, it will judge the world in the sense that it will separate the Christ people from those who have the mark of the beast. It's a final separation. First of all, the judgment from the books has made the decision about the two kingdoms. And then the two kingdoms appear in their glory in the last days. Christ's kingdom in the 144,000 and Satan's kingdom in those who have the mark of the beast. And then after this now is the end of grace. You are going to see the seven last plagues poured out upon the earth. Then Jesus comes. This is what we have seen in um, the book of Revelation. Then uh, there's a thousand years when the earth is empty and God's people are on a holiday with him for a thousand years, then the final 
revelation takes place on this planet jesus comes back his people come with him and the wicked are raised to life for the final great judgment scene they are destroyed by fire death is destroyed satan is destroyed everything is destroyed god creates a new heaven and a new earth this is the basic outline that we have seen as we went through the book of revelation all right that has been an hour and a half i'm feeling effects of talking for an hour and a half so i'm ready to take a break if there's any question comment go ahead and um if not uncle david yes justin go ahead i have a question um not necessarily about you know and and everything you just talked about but it's something i guess in terms of when jesus um i know you had presented and you had said that when jesus died and he rose he, he uh i guess he took the keys of death and hell and that basically um we were, you know, we deserve death until Jesus did that. Um, so my question is, how, what, how did um, Enoch and Elijah and Moses, how were they able to, to, to be brought to heaven before Jesus actually died? All right. This is, this is the hardest question that people ask me <laughs> because... I'm going to give you an answer, but I, even I myself, I'm not satisfied with my answer. All right? But I'm going to give you anyway. Um, I know that, my, I know that the, what you just said is biblical. The Bible teaches it. Hebrews 11 and the last two verses teaches you that these all, having obtained a good report through faith, they did not receive the promise. Because God had provided something better for us that they could not be perfected before us now i know that god sometimes works outside of the, the the norm for example he raised moses from the dead outside of the pattern and when he went to raise moses from the dead remember satan came to oppose michael and the fact that satan came to oppose michael is a statement that tells us that satan had a legal claim to the body of moses he had a legal claim to moses moses was in the dominion of death and Satan had a claim to him. So we see that legally Satan had a right. But at the same time, somehow God overruled uh, Satan. And exactly what is the principle on which he overruled him is probably something we can, we can look at another time. But the point is, how did Enoch and Elijah and Moses obtain eternal life? before eternal life was provided that's the, har the harder question we believe that our eternal life is the life of jesus but the life that saves did not exist before jesus became a man before jesus became a man he had divine life but he did not have the divine human life and the life that saves is the life of the risen christ even before jesus came to earth he was not our savior to be, to be the savior of, of men, he had to become a man. This is why it says in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. And I'll just, I'll just expand on this a little bit to make it clearer. My children are my children because I passed on life to them. In this way, they can never be anybody else's children because they receive my life transferred to them. Before I was born, they could not be my children because there was no life to pass on to them. In the same way, the children of Jesus are the children of Jesus because we have received his life. Before he became a man, he did not have any life to pass on to anybody. He could not be the father of anybody because to be our father, he had to become a human being first. So Enoch and Elijah and Moses could not have received the saved life. If you understand the plan of salvation, as I just outlined it to you, they could not have received the life that was saved. So my answer to people is this. Enoch and Moses and Elijah, what they received was long life, not eternal life. 
they receive long life, not eternal life. In other words, God extended their lives for a couple thousand years, but not until Jesus provided that, that eternal saved life were they privileged to have the life that we now possess. But because these people were so close to God, God took them out of the earth and he gave them a long holiday, if you want to put it that way. But they lived, they lived in a place where they did not die without obtaining eternal life. That's the answer that, that, that I can present to that question, Justin. Brother David. Brother David. Yes, Sister Diane and then Brother Tony. I agree. I think I agree with Brother David. All right, thank you. <laughs> Sister Diane. I agree because I think that's what they're meeting with Christ and the transfiguration was kind of all about. It was like cheering him on you can do this. You can, you know what I mean? I don't know what the conversation, but I always look at it like you're cheering them on because we don't want to go back. You can do this. You've got this, you know, I think <laughs> so they wouldn't have to go back. I think that's what that meeting was all about. <laughs> that's, that could definitely be a part of it. <laughs> Brother Tony, I, go ahead. Brother Tony. Um, yeah, but you know, prophecy always tell us what's going to happen. And God prophesied in Genesis 3.15 that Jesus was going to crush the head of Satan. Yes. yes. I mean, even though, you know, even though they say Jesus didn't do that, yet he had a choice because he had our fallen nature. But God prophesied in the Bible that this was going to happen. Jesus was going to crush the head of Satan. So I think he took them on credit, knowing what was going to be the outcome. I, I, I'm sure he did, but I'm sure he did, right? He, he gave them, they, they went, to, they went to, to heaven, wherever they went, they went with the promise of eternal life. Right, yeah. But, yeah. but not yeah. eternal life, because eternal life is, is the life of the risen Christ. Right, Jesus right. did not have that life to pass on until first of all it was provided and this this is something that I, I i learned when i began to understand righteousness by faith that righteousness by faith is not something you can just give somebody or uh, the righteous life is a life that had to be lived for example i got certain things from my father it's not just physical features but i got certain spiritual characteristics i mean i mean maybe i can give you a better example by talking about negative things you know that people can inherit a tendency towards alcoholism because, oh, yeah. because it runs it, it runs in the genetics of the family okay and i, I know yes. that there are certain weaknesses in my particular family that comes from maybe my father passed on to my brothers it just shows up in all of us there are certain strengths as well so i am not just the son of my father inheriting his physical features but i inherited also the history of what was in his body, the things he did that affects my life today. This is what we call, um, it may be genetically passed on and there may be other ways in which it is passed on, but we, we inherit the, the mistakes or the, 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 the bad, bad life that our parents live sometimes affects us. A woman who, who drinks or she's angry and upset easily when she's pregnant, it affects her child. In other words, we don't just receive the life of the parent we receive the history. We receive the history that is involved in that life. The life of Jesus Christ is not just a human divine life, but the history of that life we inherit too. So when Jesus overcame sin, we inherit this. Until Jesus overcame sin, there was no life in the universe that had defeated sin. Because Jesus had not defeated sin. God had not defeated sin. No angel had defeated sin. The first person who defeated sin was the man, Christ Jesus. So nobody had victory to give us until Jesus died. So that's a part of the life that we obtain. This is what I mean when I say Moses, Elijah, Enoch, they could have got long life, but they could not have received that life that Jesus gives us at his resurrection because it did not exist yet. 
that's a deeper understanding of what salvation means it's not just something god throws at you it's something that jesus provided jesus worked out our salvation when he lived on this earth and he defeated satan he was defeating him for you and me what are they he didn't just die I, I hear your brother sam he didn't just die to bring us out of the grave he didn't just live so we, we, we could have life. He, he lived so we could have a certain quality of life. What he did in that life was so he could have it to pass on to us. Go ahead, Brother Sam. They had the opportunity to eat from the tree of life. And that's the reason why they had long life until Jesus raised from the grave. That certainly could have been one of the reasons, Brother Sam. I know that um, the, the tree of life in the beginning was intended to help to preserve life. I know that when we have eternal life, I don't think we're going to need to eat from it to live forever. But maybe that's how they lived, you know. We don't have to eat from the tree anymore. Right. <clears throat> Go ahead, Brother Ward. I'm just um, a little bit puzzled about um, understanding some of the symbols. You know, you said the, um, the beasts are empires. Um, the horns are more nations, and the church is a woman. But what about the little horn in Daniel? Because it seems to be, we've always thought of it as being the Catholic Church, speaking blasphemies and all this sort of thing, grew up to be something. Um, so how do you reconcile that? Is it a different symbol there or what? The, the, in, in the book of Daniel, horns are used to represent minor kingdoms, and in some cases, it represents an outstanding king. For example, when he talks about the, the ram and the he-goat, the he-goat had a notable horn before it's, uh, in its forehead, and we, we are told that this horn was the first king. Then the horn is broken and four more come up, and you see that these four more are the four divisions of the Grecian Empire. So it's a smaller kingdom or in some cases an outstanding king now when you go to daniel 7 you see this little horn what we have said if we say this little horn is a catholic church i think we're speaking a little bit carelessly because typically what we have said what we understand is that this little horn represents the papacy now the papacy is not strictly speaking the catholic church it's the catholic church in its form as a, a, a nation it's it's a we, we have said it's a religio political power we look at it as a political entity because among the nations of the beast empire among the nations of europe the papacy became a different kind of nation it wasn't just a church it, it wielded all the political power of any any nation and in fact today you know that the papacy is a, the vatican is actually a country with its own ambassadors and all of that so it is it is it is really in truth a nation in the strictest sense of the word so you have these ten ten horns ten sub kingdoms another horn comes up among them it has to be another kingdom it can't be simply an individual so the it, it, we are looking at the papacy here and not just the the pope and not just the catholic church but the 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 the, the, the catholic church in its form as a nation a small nation, but a very powerful one. Uh, Brother, David, that's, um, Brother David, that's kind of the argument they tend to use for the first beast in Revelation 13 as well, that they tend to use that idea that it's it's in its both forms. That it's I know I, I believe what you're saying, but I'm just trying to get through the understanding of clarifying the arguments they put against it. You know? Yes, the, the beast in Revelation 13 has seven heads and ten horns that's not a small kingdom that's an empire because an empire has sub kingdoms you know the, the horn in daniel 7 is clearly a small kingdom but but you can't look at the, 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 the this empire with ten horns and seven heads uh, covering seven other nations and say that this is simply one small kingdom you know so there, there are quite a few discrepancies few differences that you know make it clear it's not the same power Thank you. Thank you, Brother Larry. You're welcome, Brother Larry. Uh, Brother David, can you... Yes, um, I see 
Clara Pitt yet. I'm not sure who this is. <laughs> I'm using uh, someone else's account, but uh, yeah, it, I want to say I've been watching your sermons for over a year, and I really, really agree with your assessment of the the woman or the whore of Babylon representing more than strictly Catholicism, really being the false religions that have been used to persecute God's people throughout history. And uh, I also agree that because she is destroyed by the ten horns, the final state of religion in the last days before Christ returns will be atheism. But I wanted to ask, how does that coincide with what Paul says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, with the man of sin being destroyed by the second coming of Christ? I, I, think, I think one of the things we will do, we will approach as soon as we are actually fully finished with Revelation is to look at some of those other prophecies. Because um, I, I agree with you that the, the man of sin represented in, Reve in um, 2 Thessalonians 2 seems to point directly to a religious individual. And I mean, most people, if somebody says that this represents the Pope, I don't see any reason why I would object to this. So the point is that the Pope as an individual what, what we see in Second Thessalonians 2 is a, a focus on an individual because it says the man of sin sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And this has to refer to an individual. We could say it's a dynasty, okay? A sequence of individuals, but still it's focused on an individual person. So we would make a difference between the individual and the church because the church is represented as a woman Babylon. But the Pope himself in his own right has a great deal of impact and influence on what is happening in the world. And it, it, it may be that the Pope himself has a major part to play in, in the events of the end time and will meet his own personal demise at the coming of Jesus. So I think when you look at two prophecies in two different contexts, Revelation is full of symbolism and it's focused on certain things. But when Paul was talking about the man of sin, his emphasis was different. So it's tempting to combine, combine it with Revelation and say, since Revelation speaks of the church in this way, then Paul must be, Paul's prophecy must overlap with it. But I don't think it's necessarily so, which is why I, I, I think we will take a look at that particular prophecy in greater detail sometime soon. Well, thank you. Thank you. And because an interesting theory or thought that I had was that Catholicism as an institution would continue to exist, and even the Pope may exist, but the public perception will see it as a necessary institution, a cultural institution, and it's it would basically be understood as being atheistic, meaning no one would actually take it seriously. I have spoken to many Catholics my age and younger that see Catholicism as a, a necessary cultural power like it's good just to be there but they don't actually believe it and that's that's just an idea i had but no thank you i look forward to that sermon you're welcome brother uh, you said your name is uh michael uh michael. i also sent a message on facebook yes okay thank, thank you brother michael i appreciate the thought hey brother david i have a question hey, um if um i consider that the roman catholic institution has never ever been the church of God to begin with. So the man that sits on the throne on the, on the seat of on the throne of God, meaning in the church, it must be a church that belongs to God or belong once belonged to God. I understand that the Roman Catholic Church has never ever belonged to God. So it must be talking about someone else. Okay, let me let me when you look at the, the, the New Testament concept of the church, there are two, two things to consider. There is a church that is made up of only true Christians. And there's a church that, are, that is made up of all who claim to be Christians. We have to understand this. And you, you can't look at the Bible and think that this is not so. Because when you look at the ten virgins, for example, how many of them are true Christians? Five. How many of them claim to be Christians? Ten. You look at the story of the, the wedding supper. Everybody comes to the wedding supper and one man comes without a wedding garment. Does he claim to be a Christian? He does. But is he? No. 
so this is this is a part of the the reason why we even talk about the separation of the wheat from the tears because there are those who bear the resemblance and maybe even carry the name so the christian church on a broader spectrum is everybody who claims the name of christ that's an important point that the temple of god is to be cleansed but in the meantime in that temple are those who bear the name of christ but they don't really belong there and the final sorting out of things has to do with the final separation of the wheat from the tears so I see the temple of God as being the place that belongs to Christ. But in that temple, in the Christian church, there are elements that are fake. And the man of sin is one of them. He sits in the Christian church. And I don't mean the Catholic church. I mean the Christian body. Because that is the New Testament concept of the, of the temple. The New Testament concept of the temple is the, the, the church of God. So within the church of Christ, there is this person who has risen to great prominence and who, who has even usurped the prerogatives of Christ. So, so this is why I, I think it's perfectly consistent with thinking that this person is the, the Pope or the dynasty of Popes. Yes, Sister Dai. Um, so since the man of sin, everybody's looking at, looking for, I said everybody, but you know what I mean. The world is looking for this antichrist, this person, so if this man of sin is revealed and he's the antichrist, then his being destroyed makes sense because now he's revealed. He does whatever he does. And now the people see the deception in him. So if they kill him, even though the woman still exists, because even when uh, 1798, when the Pope was taken, the church still existed. So it didn't take away from her existence because he was gone. Would that make sense that he gets destroyed and then the woman, the institution is destroyed? Is that it? Um, it kind of seems the other way around, like the institution is destroyed, but he remains because it says that he is to be whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. But he right. remains unto the coming of Christ, even though the church is gone. Wait now, I'm confused because if he is restored, if he's destroyed with the brightness of his coming, who is being burnt? Whose flesh is being burnt by the beast and the false prophet? It's the system. It's the organization because the beast is is, is not Babylon is not a person. It's an institution. Right. So so, um, brother Michael um said something a while ago, but my 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 my, my understanding is that they. The institutions of the churches are going to be raped by the atheists. If you look at if you look at Europe today, the churches are being taken over by nightclubs. The, 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 the property of the churches are going to be taken away. The positions of, 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 of the pastors, the influence that the churches have, it's going to be completely taken away when the, the, the society becomes more atheistic. The, the, the raping of Babylon, the looting of Babylon is the taking away of the property and the influence. Everything that belongs to these churches is going to be taken away. It's going to be secular, secularized like, like happened under communism. That's what I anticipate. Uh, okay, and what some of the uh, terrorists, whatever you call them, did when they were having their reign, they were looting the churches and, and taking those artifacts and destroying the, the statues and things of that nature. It'll be on a grander scale than that. I, I think so. The religious institutions are, are going to be completely eliminated as elements of influence in society. Because if, 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 if what we are seeing is correct, and the last great movement on this world will be a, a, an atheistic, anti-God movement. Right now you see the hatred that, that people have for the name of Christ. If you go into, a, into any forum and talk about Jesus and how they, they think you are stupid, you see that they, 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 they portray Christianity. And the, the, the only news you hear about Christianity is if, is if some minister behaves stupid or if some Christian does something stupid. They don't put you in the news otherwise. They, they, they mock you in parliament when parliament meets and they, on the news when they talk about Christians, when they have a talk show, that, uh, 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 an interview thing, and they have Christians and doctors and so on, they always choose the, the most silly Christian who doesn't have any sense, that some little pastor from the bush who doesn't know what he's talking about, and they bring him on with these scientists or pastors to show up his stupidity. They ridicule and mock Christianity 
they are belittling it and and in an educated world christianity has no place and it will come to the place i mean it's it's further it's further uh, amplified by the fact that these these greedy thieves like um the austins and the um copeland and so on they have their private planes they have their air conditioned dog houses they are they are robbing the, they are taking millions and millions of dollars while their their congregants go hungry and everybody is seeing this hypocrisy in christianity and it's it's creating a, a a universal hatred of christianity that is going to explode in the destruction of the christian institutions so that would then be the reign of terror <laughs> something like a that second, right it corresponds a second, to it. second a second reign of terror second french revolution yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I can see how that would happen, and yet the Pope as an individual may continue to live. You know, he's the head of a, of a sovereign state. They, they, they may not attack the Vatican because it's not a, a church as such. It's a sovereign state. And he's a person who, he, he, he is a, a, a head of state in his own right. He's respected in his own right. His connection with the Catholic Church is only incidental, as it were. So I can see how he would continue unto the coming well, of Jesus, even if the church well, was destroyed. Well, that's true because there's two of them living, and and the and 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 Benedict is there, while Francis is there, and Benedict is there running from charges <laughs> that he would have been guilty of on the world stage, but now he has asylum there, so you know, two of them are reigning really. If I uh, may also mention a startling observation I've noticed in the recent years is this idea is that people want the righteousness of Christianity without acknowledging the sonship of Christ. And if you even look into America's history, Thomas Jefferson had actually published a version of the gospels that removed all the miracles. And it was just the teachings of Jesus. And this is kind of what I think might happen with atheism being the final uh, the final prevailing thought is that people will say, well, you know, it's good not to kill, not to steal, not to commit adultery. These are all things, but they're ignoring the first commandment. And I think maybe the aesthetics, the cultural institutions, like you even said, perhaps even the Vatican may remain, but it's it's completely a husk of what it formerly was. My, my brother, you said a mouthful. You almost make me want to start a sermon. <laughs> The the, 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 the the lie in the world and it it, it, embra it is embraced by the Christian world, which is why righteousness by faith is so necessary. The lie in the Christian world is that morality is what we need. The lie of the world that the Christians have embraced is that what we need is morality. They glorify immorality, not realizing Immorality is just sophisticated legalism. What we need is not morality. We need Christ. If you feed the poor and you take care of the sick and you are not a Christian, you can't have salvation. You don't have true goodness. True goodness is not, doesn't begin with what you do. It begins with who lives in you. This is the difference with Christianity. Islam or, or Hinduism or Buddhism can promote morality. The Kiwanis can do it. The social clubs can do it. Only Jesus Christ can give new life. And we Christians, we must never compromise on that. When I go into other Christian groups and I hear them talking about the, 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 the great people like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and, and Mother Teresa. Teresa, yeah. I want to puke. Because these Christians do not know the gospel of Christ. How can you put, put, put social people who, who, who are socially... Uh, you know, they, they follow social programs and they do a little good. And you put that on an equality, they call their names in the same breath as Christ. We need not only to know the truth, but to share the truth that people may understand that morality won't save anybody. And what the world needs is not morality. It is the Son of God. Amen. Right, Amen. Um, David, yes. Christ calls it works of iniquity. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. That's what he calls it. Yes. Everything outside of Christ is evil, no matter how good it looks. Amen. Yeah. It, it, 
Amen. It, re it reminds me of Catholicism and Islam. They're very similar in their ideology because both have a works-based system of getting to heaven. The more good you do, it'll outweigh, it'll get you there. And that was Teresa, hate to call her mother, Teresa's ideology. You know what I mean? She, some right. people idolized her to the point of sainthood. But when you look at her life and see what she said, she was doing those, she was in India and she did those people this way because she was working her way to heaven. She was trying to get sainthood. It wasn't because she cared for those brown people. It was because she was working her way to heaven. True. Like, what, what is most horrifying is that mm -hmm. there are many Christians who have bought into this. Okay. They, 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 they think Christianity is about morality. And even though morality appears in the life of the Christian, it's a byproduct. It's secondary. And even though morality appears in the life of the Christian, it's a byproduct. Brother Tony, your mic is on. But see, that's the same way they say about... That's the same as they say about Mary. You know, they put her sitting on the right hand of, of God in heaven. You know, and then they pray to Holy Mary, you know, with the rosary beads. So it's all a trick of fate. Absolutely. Absolutely.